Hello everyone and welcome. Um, and this presentation is going to be the, the capstone presentation of our, our 10 week study group that we did. Uh, so we've been following along the uh, Doing Bayesian Data Analysis textbook by John Krishka. And so uh, the following presentation sort of assumes that you know a little bit about sampling, Monte Carlo, uh, Markov chain, Monte Carlo, uh, things like regression, uh, and a few other things. Uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Keith Arurk from Health Canada. Uh, thanks very much. I'm uh, pleased to uh, do a second take. Uh, <laughs> I've had a chance to revise the slides and get rid of the errors I've uh, found. And of course, there's two types of errors, those you've found and those you haven't found yet. Um, so now, back to the slides. And uh, I've called the talk Principal Bayesian Workflow, subtitled Practicing Safe Bayes. So now you can Bayes you need to do it safely, especially in a regulatory environment. This is motivated by courses I gave at Health Canada in 2010 and 11 on Bayesian statistics that resulted in less than critical review of submissions. You don't really understand what people get from a course or a talk until you see them using it in their work, and then you get a better sense of what they actually did get from it. And today is largely to provide motivation to read and work through materials and programs developed by uh, Michael uh, Betancourt. Um, now the GitHub for his material is here, and the link is there, and you can get it either in RSTAN, which is STAN interface from the R software, or PyStan, which is STAN software accessed by Python. And I'll do a largely uh, conceptual introduction and work through a toyed down example. I've taken Michael's example and I made something simpler just so we can get through it uh, more quickly. And the files for this talk, um, including the programs, are at this link. So you can access them as you're listening to this or afterwards. So just quickly give some, some of my relevant background for this talk. I provide statistical support and mentorship to really talented research fellows at the University of Toronto when I started my career, and I was there in 1985 to 1998. And one of the problems with working with really talented people when you first start out is you seem every, you, you get the sense that everyone else is like them. Uh, and of course that's not true. One ended up being the president of the University of Toronto, the other one is, uh, one of the others is the vice president of research right now. Um, but I had no degrees in statistics. But I also was still allowed to teach a course in the university and gave multiple tutorials. Uh, I was recruited to the Auto Hospital in uh, 1998 2001. Um, and there I found out that not having credentials was a bigger problem. So I went off to Oxford to do a DPhil in statistics and, and finally get a degree in statistics. And I was there 2001 2003, and then I spent four years doing revisions to, to finish the thesis. Afterwards, I visited the Statistical Sciences Department at Duke University, and that's mentioned because, as their website says, they're the, the world's leading center for Bayesian statistics, and that's where I guess I learned most about Bayesian statistics. I joined Health Canada in 2009, and I gave those Bayesian courses in 2010-11. I'm currently at the Pest Management Regulatory Authority. Uh, I've given webinars on Bayes for the American Statistical Society and the Canadian Society for Epidemiology and Biostatistics in 2012. Uh, the first was reviewed positively, the second not so much. Um, there's always a, a challenge of knowing what people know and don't know when you're giving a talk. And I think I presume too much that they didn't know in the second one. Uh, I'm currently an author on statistical modeling, causal inference, and social science, which is a, a mainly Bayesian perspective blog, and the link is there to sort of my post, which also gets you there. I, this is something, if you think you're going to be doing Bayesian analysis, it's a way to plug in to what's being currently developed in the field, um, because it is a developing field, it's nothing static, and so, uh, in fact, the material I'm presenting today was pretty much not around five years ago. Some of my early experience in Bayesian work, I used someone's published uh, Bayesian model to do some analysis, evolved proportions, 
and I got the posterior probabilities for negative proportions, which are impossible. So I emailed a colleague at the University of Toronto who was a Bayesian, and he was scratching his head, and I was scratching my head, but I had learned how to uh, simulate from priors. So I had simulated from the priors, and I found out that the priors are putting positive probability on negative proportions, which is silly. But what had happened was the person doing the Bayesian modeling had assumed independence of the probabilities in the prior to make it easier. And when they did their analysis, they had lots of data, so it didn't show up as a problem. I had very little data, so the negative probabilities were showing up in the posterior. Um, and sometimes it's hard to know when you have adequate data. In fact, that's one of the topics I'll cover later in today. But the prior is obviously wrong and should be fixed. You know, the idea about doing modeling is you, if you know something's wrong about the model, fix it. And negative probabilities are wrong, so it won't happen. This sort of thing was done a lot in the early 2000s, given the limitations. Uh, I know a colleague of mine who was actually one of the leading bases at the time. I looked at some of his work, and he too was putting um, positive probability on uh, negative proportions and proportions greater than one in the logistic regression application because it made it easier to get the program to run. But these days, we have better programs. We shouldn't be doing that sort of thing. I'm going to do a conceptual review of Bayes. Um, and I want to get a sense of seeing all of Bayes at once. No mathematical formulas. Okay? I just want to see it. I, so I need to go back and focus on basics. It's not always popular. Now, I was once told by someone who ran the martial arts uh, school that they hide the best techniques in the beginner's form. And the reason they do that is beginners, they have to struggle with this first form for like six months to a year, and then they get to learn second and third forms. And they were really embarrassed and awkward when they did that, so they don't want to go back and practice it. The only one who practices it are the instructors. And so it's a way of keeping the good techniques just for your instructors. Um, now, two-stage simulation, which I'll describe later, people in the course would have known about it because I talked about it on the first day, and Krushki did something like it in his book. And, but it's, it's a, an easy way to do Bayesian analysis when the problems are not too challenging. And when people use it in teaching days, in introductory days, and there's a number of people who've done it, uh, Richard McElreath and uh, uh, Rasmuth Bath, and others, it doesn't kind of work. And what one person told me was, they see it as a cheap trick. Like, it's not real days, it's sort of a cheap trick to do a toy problem, and so they don't want to pay any attention to it. It's, it's like a beginner's form. Once they're through it, they don't want to go back and think about it. But it's really a way to really, really understand what's going on in Bayesian analysis. I first came up with it in 2004, and I was told I was wrong by numerous people. Um, I later learned that Don Rubin from Harvard had come up with it in 1984 in a paper that I probably had read and forgotten about, and so maybe I didn't re recreate it. Um, but it, it's solid. And, and, and I'll show you, in fact, it's, it, it's, uh, it's obvious that it's solidly Bayesian analysis. And so one of the reasons why I want to do this is Andrew Gelman, who blogs and all this on that, blog I mentioned earlier. He blogged numerous times this expression. In Bayes, you write down the model, and you simply watch it work. And I have crickets in the brackets, because it's hard to tell on a blog, but the other commenters and either the other authors did not seem to get it. But I'll show from a two-page, from a two-stage sampling perspective, it is obvious. It was obvious what he meant. But people couldn't see it when you come at it from a mathematical perspective, worrying about doing MCMC sampling and writing programs to do it. But there's so much more. Okay? And Michael Betancourt, whose work I've referred people to, he puts it like this, work it, make it, do it. So he's referring to the Bayesian model, to make us harder, better, faster, stronger. So we want to do better Bayesian analysis. And this two-stage sampling is the way that it's enabled. 
Now, anyone's read anything about Bayes, there's numerous wild claims about Bayes. In particular, before I did that uh, American Statistical Association webinar, they gave me the previous one that someone had done. And the set, there was a, a comment like this in this, uh, this webinar. No need to worry if you're unsure about the prior. There's lots of non-informative priors that work just great. I know that's totally wrong. But it's nice to tell people, because <laughs> it gets the Dubasy analysis right away. Here's a, a quote from, from actually McElreath, who I mentioned is one of the people who, who teaches a lot in, in Bayesian analysis. The term, the term, term non-informative appears to be a Worfian trick of language. Just as an empty gas can drum is more dangerous than a full one, a non-informative prior may distort estimates more than an informative one. If you don't know about Worf, he had uh, linguistic relativity and had this example of a factory being burnt down because the workers would go smoke by the empty gas cans. Empty gas cans, gas liquids don't burn, it's the fumes. So the empty can, gas cans were more dangerous, but they seem less dangerous. And this is one of the problems with expressions like non-formative priors, is people think they're not bringing information. Well, they actually, actually you are, often in dangerous ways. Um, so, and, and, and it's always in science, the motto is, take no one's word for it. And part of the advantage of this two-stage two sampling is you don't have to take anyone's word about it. You can see. You can try it out yourself and find out what happens. That'll become clear in the talk, I hope. So you need to worry if you aren't sure about the prior. One of the first I heard was uh, Peter Thal at MD Anderson Cancer Center. This is a long slide, but it's here because he was uh, one of the, you know, certainly well-established Bayesian statisticians at MD Anderson. And he was doing um, basically um, an up and down dose finding study uh, and he was using a Bayesian logistic regression and he used a non-informative prior in that analysis. And as he said, the resulting uh, design does strange things with the first three to six patients. And it drove me and my programmer crazy for a month. In fact, in, in one of his verbal presentations, he said he was actually in the hallway hitting his head against the wall because they couldn't understand what was wrong. Um, and that was only 2011, which is fairly recent. Now, what I'm giving here quickly without going into it is there's a scan prior choice recommendations wiki. And if you go to that link, it'll give you some suggestions about what to do with and without priors. And because it's a wiki and because they're kind of a a constant research group involving, I don't know, at least a couple dozen or more researchers. When they find something out, it goes into the wiki pretty quickly. So back, no, no, actually now we're just doing a conceptual review of statistics, statistics itself. And so now we want to see all of statistics at once. In both Bayes and frequentist statistics, the holy grail is clearly seeing what repeatedly would happen when trying to learn from observations like the ones you have in hand. So you, you get a data set, you want to learn from it. But you want to know what would repeatedly happen if you got data sets like that over and over again. Okay? And a helpful metaphor for this kind of thinking is um, discerning what casts shadows. Think of learning about an object just from the shadows it casts while being unable to look directly at the object. I used this recently in some lunch and learns at PMRA for uh, science evaluators, and this helped them get a better grasp of statistics. We see these shadows, but really are only interested in what's casting them. They may look very scary, but the object casting them may be mice. It's all too common to take noisy observations as reality that generated them. So people say there was an effect in, there was an effect in that study. No, you saw an effect in that study. It doesn't mean there is one. It's just a shadow. Okay? What you're really interested in is the underlying true effect, which you don't have direct access to. You can't look it up somewhere. So the shadows are the data. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Shadows are the data. Yeah. And, um, and, but you're not interested in, you know, like, one of the other ways of saying this, you know, in, in studies of um, how often rats get cancer, you don't care about the 10 rats you've had in the study. You care about the underlying population. The same idea. So what you see is what, not what you're interested in. You're interested in things behind it. And so a strategy in statistics, actually the underlying strategy is essentially generate realistic fake universes to better grasp reality. Okay, And I'll, I'll go through this right now. You make something where you can easily see what will repeatedly happen. In analytical chemistry, you can repeatedly spike text, test tubes with known trace amounts of chemical X. And then you take machine readings. And so you learn how to relate the machine readings to what you know you put into the test tubes. And you can use many test tubes. And you can vary the amount of chemical you put in. Okay. In statistics, we can't repeatedly spike humans with, say, known faint rates or known side effect rates. You can't do that. So you have to do something abstract. Okay, so we have to represent fake rate, faint rates abstractly. Make a fake universe where you set the rate at which people faint, and you see what repeatedly happens. Most statisticians prefer to use probabilities and math to do that. So if you heard about probability, you can think of probability as a shadow generating machine where you set the parameter, which is what casts the shadows, and the shadows are repeated samples determined by that parameter value. Until quite recently, you could only do that with mathematics, and actually very difficult mathematics, and that's what made statistics unaccessible for, for a lot of people. Today, that's changed. Today, almost anyone can use probability models in simulation to make fake universes. Simulation is much better now than it was five or ten years ago. You can do so much more because computers are so much faster. So I've just given some definitions of math and then simulation. Math is the exact study of ideal states of things. Ideal states of things is like a fake universe. It's a fake universe. Okay. Simulation is the approximate study of the same. So you can use simulation to find out what repeatedly happens in a fake universe. Um, now, my uh, 20 examples today will be, um, oh, right, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so, T, missed the point here. Two stage simulation is just the Bayesian version of generating realistic enough fake universes. And the realistic enough is a question mark. That's always a question because we don't have direct access to the reality of our universe. The, my toy example today will be annual faint rates in business leaders' rounds at the Toronto Hospital, where three out of nine fainted the one year I heard about it. This is when I worked at the Toronto Hospital. They would invite business leaders, they'd come around the hospital giving advice on computer systems and accounting systems and inventory systems, and then the last part of the tour was always going through a live uh, operating theater, and, and they'd have a resident with each person because they knew a certain percentage would fail, and they would keep account each year. So again, we're interested in the underlying faint rates of people going through this kind of situation. In our study, we saw three out of nine. So let's plot the set of, the, the set of fake universes. So two-stage simulation is simply simulate the true faint rate, the one you're setting in this fake university, fake, <laughs> fake universe, and then the number of faints given that rate. So you draw the parameter, use that parameter in the binomial distribution to generate the number of nine that faint. And so, let's see, we see this, right? So this universe here has a, a, a faint, faint rate of around 10%. And you can see how often various faints happen. This one here has a, almost everyone faints. Right? It's a very high rate. Okay. And so along here is the universe. Each universe here in this simple problem is determined by an underlying true faint rate. And then you see what repeatedly happens along this axis here for each universe. 
Once the joint model is set, let me go ahead a bit, just because I think this might help a little bit more. Don't read the up here, just look here. This is the one I just showed you, okay? That's the, the set of fake universes. Over here, I've coded in red those fake universes which are compatible, or most compatible, with our universe. See, in our universe, 3 out of 9 fainted. So the ones in red are the, 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 what happened in the fake, fake universes is compatible with what happened in ours. And that red little thing here, that's the posterior distribution. Right? Okay. So you have a prior, you have a data generating model, the data generating model tells you how often things repeatedly happen. So sample from the prior, sample some data, do that over and over and over. I've done it thousands of times here. Keep only those that match the actual observations in your study. That's the posterior distribution. This is mathematically correct, totally valid. Okay, It's just a different way of, instead of writing the math, I've drawn a picture of it. Okay, so now we'll just go back to this slide here, which hopefully will make more sense now. Why do, make, why do we make these fake universes of faint rates and occurrences? Especially since we know how to use MCMC sampling and, and can get the posterior right away. Well, once the joint model is set, the prior and data generating model, Bayes is deductive. The joint model is the first premise, the data is the second premise, and the posterior is the conclusion. Assuming adequate sampling from the posterior, the quality of what follows totally depends on the premises. In deductive arguments, they're valid if the premises are valid. If the premises are not quite... So it can be very bad that premises are deficient. So we really have to get a sense of whether the premises are solid or not. And premises are either the joint model, the prior and the data joining model, and the data in hand. Is it a small, crummy, noisy data set? Is it, is it a highly bias-selective data set? That matters. So, and this now with the picture here, to go back up to the text at the beginning, so the, the first premise is on the left, okay, which is the joint, you know, the, the set of fake universes. Do they adequately represent our grasp of reality? And I put here in brackets, as in an artist's pencil sketch. When an artist sketches someone's portrait, there's no color. The size is wrong. But there's something about reality they've captured that's useful. And that's what I mean by adequately represent. And note the conclusion in red on the right is con clearly contained in the premises. So the old QED from math. So this is a this is graphical proof that is deductive. Consistent with domain expertise. Um, you, 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 we can look at this, this here and you know, if we got nine fake universes and ten possible faint totals out of nine, or ten possible out of nine, um, and what we need to have is a sort of proportional set of fake universes and fake, to fake totals that we judge could be encountered in topics like this. So here I'm thinking a Bayesian analysis like this I might reuse um, in different groups, groups of people fainting in other things where I suspect, you know, the minority of people it will occur to, okay? Um, and this is sort of like a Bayesian reference set. Now, Bayesian reference set means the prior represents things that you expect to run into in analysis of this sort, okay? And the frequency reference set the term, it really is about what kind of sample is the same as the sample you have? In our toy example, it's not very confusing, but in other areas, uh, you have to be careful. Um, don't want to spend too much time in it, but in a, in a regression problem, um, the you know, repeated data sets should have the same x values if you set them. Right? So it's, it's not immediate how to make a, a fre frequency reference set. Oh, that's a bit of a distraction. So things to consider on the last slides, are these fake universes and repeatedly happening faint totals roughly like your universe? The biggest fail so far may be an air density greater than concrete 
in air quality modeling. People were doing Bayesian air quality modeling, and someone uh, came along and did this, this two-stage sampling and found out that 90% uh, of the time the um, air density was, uh, was more dense in concrete. So a really silly model. Um, now, if it's not too wrong, okay, if these fake universes are not too wrong, it provides an ample laboratory to evaluate the performance of a given joint model and data. And that's sort of why you don't have to take anyone's word for it anymore. Um, and this might be other place here, but often a good idea to use a different joint model to create the fake universes than to evaluate the Bayesian model actually being used in the analysis. Because we know we're going to get the fake universes not quite right. So part of this you should make, you know, vary what you're creating in the two-stage sampling, but using the same model that you would use in the analysis. So now we're going to look at uh, ways of viewing the fake universe marginally. Okay. So the first one is to just look at the distribution of all all parameters, all fame rates. Right. You just collapse over the fake universes. Okay. So that's the marginal prior. The other way is just to collapse all the observed faint totals, and that's the prior predictive. Okay, one is in the parameter space, one is in the sample space. Okay, um, some arguably only look at the second, at the sort of sample space, uh, which has advantages, especially with many parameters. When you get a large number of parameters you have a multi-dimensional parameter distribution look at it, it's hard to get a sense of what's sensible and what's not sensible. Whereas if you look at the sort of uh, samples that that would generate, there you can get a better sense of whether the samples are reasonable. Like with the air density, the, the, the looking at the, the distribution of uh, in the prior, you probably wouldn't be able to tell it would do something like that with air density because it's a complicated function. Um, well, I would look at both, because I'm looking at what might be wrong. Okay, But this is the bigger point here, maybe. So much more to make of the set of fake universes generated. So I've just printed out the, a couple here on the, the left and the right. And the samples on the left, these are valid posterior samples, right? Because we, they have three things, and that happened in our universe. And remember, the way we get the posteriors, we keep all, uh, all the um, points in the fake universes where there were three things. Over here, this one, that would be a, a posterior sample for someone who observed eight out of nine faints, right? And again, for the zero, if someone has studied with zero faints, that would be a valid sample from their posterior history. Now, in this course, people have learned how to use MCMC sampling. Okay, so each one of these is also a valid sample, right? So you put three out of nine. You run uh, MCMC samplers and get, let's say, 500 um, draws from the posterior, and you look at the rank of those 500 compared to this parameter here, and you do that for all the points you generated. And if, there, if your MCMC is valid and working right, the ranks will be uniform. There's no reason for the sample from the two stage to be at the higher percentile or the lower percentile. Same distribution, it'll be, it'll be uniform. So this gives you a way to check your MCMC sampler. Because right? you got two valid samples. If they're both from the same distribution. Okay. Well, I should say, the two stage is always val uh, valid unless you made a programming error. And the MCMC MC MC is sometimes valid. Right. Um, and so, but, so you can check the MCMC MC sampling for every point in the fake universe is generated, where you have a true parameter and you have a valid sample. So there's three tasks in principle Bayesian workflow so it'll be safer. Assess the adequacy of the joint model, posterior sampling, and data. 
Assessing the adequacy of the joint model has only become practical in the past five years or so. If you're seeing this talk, you might wonder, why, are, why isn't everyone doing this? Or All this stuff I read for babies for the last ten years, I've seen no one do this. It's because it, it wasn't practical. It's just become practical recently. Uh, and around 2012, even experts were refusing. Uh, I remember asking um, someone who is the uh, president of the Bayesian Statistical Society for some sense of uh, what their priors were doing in an analysis, and they said, that's not kosher in Bayesian analysis. You can't, you're not supposed to ask me that. Um, and there's still some resistance to assessing the adequacy of the data. I mean, if you have crummy data, you're going to be misled. You know. um, and so, but with crummy data, you'll get a posterior distribution. And how are you going to know that it's not a good posterior distribution? Lots can and did go wrong in past Bayesian analysis. It remains the most challenging aspect. This sort of principle Bayesian workflow, <laughs> another reason why you might not see a lot of people using it, doing it, it is hard. It's work. And you can only find out how you're wrong, and how you have to improve your work. If you're busy, you don't might not have time for that. And this is sort of more directly taken from Michael Betancourt's work. Um, and he talks about uh, domain expertise consistency. Is our model consistent with our domain expertise? Is that the set of eight universes, is that reasonable? Computational faithfulness. Are our computational tools sufficient to accurately fit the model? That is, is the MCMC sampling working? Working. Model sensitivity. How do we expect our inferences to perform over possible samples in the fake universe? So possible samples could be crummy samples, or good samples, or large samples. And we'll show how you can do that in the bit as well. The last one I bracketed, which is model adequacy, is our model rich enough to capture the relevant structure in, of our universe? Because when you have a posterior distribution, you can simulate future data sets from that. And so when you do that, you'll want to see future, de future data sets that are similar to yours. If they're not similar to yours, you've probably made a mistake somewhere. But you don't need two-stage sampling for that, so I have brackets for that reason. So I'm going to change to a more sensible set of fake universes for my problem, because I don't think it's likely in the situation I'm facing that 90% of the people will, fail, will faint. And um, that's based on some of my background. I really should talk to a domain expert about this. But these are adults. They're in a non-life-threatening situation. They were warned what was about to happen. And so I don't expect 90% of them to fail. Um, even a few of them may have been surgeons at one time. So, I just changed my set of possible universes. So, most of the universes, the faint rates are less than 50%. Okay? But I do allow small chances of larger faint rates. And so now, when I condition on the three faints I had in my study to get the posterior, this would be the posterior there. Okay. So I'm going to go forward with this better set of fake universes, which makes more sense to me. And all I'm doing here is I'm switching to RSTAN, which has uh, prior predictive functions. Um, and for those who were in the course, I think there was an exercise where the data statement was commented out, yep. and that was to simulate from the prior. And that's the way people used to do it. It's very, very inefficient. Because you're using MCMC to generate prior samples, which are usually independent. You can just do it much faster directly. So the STAN people put that in the STAN program so that you can generate it directly because they're interested in this two-stage sampling and phasing workflow. Um, so I'm getting a much larger sample size because it's much, much more efficient. Um, so is the red, what we're seeing here is your, your the, prior? No, the red is the posterior, right? Oh. Okay. Because this is a, a set of fake universes, right? And here's three faints, 
three things happen in our universe. So that identifies the posterior. Okay. So when you say you made a change in the previous slide, what? This part here changed. Um, or we, we can go back. See? There's not... Remember there used to be fake universes with a really high faint rates? Yeah. They're gone. I don't think they're appropriate for this analysis. Okay. So you changed the prior? So I changed the prior. Oh, I see. Okay. And that should be based on real do domain expertise. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but remember, I can check this out. Well, you, you, you haven't seen that yet. So I can use both priors, okay, and see if doing this has really put me at risk in any sense. And this is just um, because I have more sample size, I just do the marginal prior. And so to me, uh, this kind of looks right. It allows for universes with really small faint rates. Maybe that's true in our universe, okay? And it also does allow some large faint rates, okay? So the idea is you don't really want to over-concentrate it. You'd be better off to under-concentrate it. But generally, you want the bulk of it to be where you think, from your background, from your domain knowledge, things should be going on. And there is the prior predictive distribution. Again, this is a toy example. There's nothing too interesting here. But you see occasionally there are some high faints, and occasionally there's no faints. Now, if there's a domain expert, I should show them that and say, does this look reasonable? So this is back to the computational faithfulness. And again, uh, we're checking out to see whether the MCMC worked. And so we have this two-state sample, which gives us all these valid um, posterior draws for different faint rates. And we're going to use MCMC to generate 500 for each one of these points here and see if they're uniform ranked with uh, the true parameter that generated that, that number of faints in that fake universe. So now we can check the MCMC family sampling for every point in the fake universe is generated. And this is a graph where I'm doing a histogram of the ranks. That's not uniform. So what went wrong? Well, when I was doing the programming, uh, I put the wrong parameters in the prior in the MCMC program. I, said, I should leave this in, right? I made a programming error in my MCMC, and hey, look, I learned about it. Now, I went back and fixed the program, and so now it's all fine. So this is just a histogram, and this is a, a confidence interval, so that um, all of them should be within that. This one here is a little bit off, but I've done this about 20 times, and this was the last one, and that showed up in the last one. So when you're doing these simulation things, you know, it, it's worthwhile doing a few of them, um, unless they take two weeks or something like that. But even then, it's always worth doing more than one. Um, that's the thing about simulation, is that it's sort of self-calibrating as, 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 as long as you do many of them. Okay, so. And there's also, in, in Michael Bettencourt's uh, programs, this um, uh, program to uh, run all the utility diagnostics for MCMC. You probably learned about some of them in, in the course. There's a bunch of them. Uh, and so it'll run through those uh, for each point each point in. Okay. And so uh, that's kind of another way to ch check that the, the MCMC is working. Now, model sensitivity. This is where we get into uh, how good is our data. Okay. And this is going to take a little bit of an explanation. But down here I have the posterior shrinkage. And what that is, is it's 1 minus the ratio of the posterior variance to the prior variance. If the data is being informative, this will be close to 0. And so this posterior shrinkage will be close to 1. Okay. So if you have a really good study design and a really good sample size, 
they'll all be here. This is kind of a small study, so it should not be too surprising that, you know, um, the, 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 it's not being shrunk that much. The, the posterior variance often is not that much lower than the prior variance. There's not much learning. Along here is the posterior Z score. Now, for each one of these points in the fake universes that I generated, right, I know the truth. I know exactly what it is. It's right there. But I also now have the posterior mean from the MCMC analysis of it. So I can sort of take the mean minus the truth divided by the standard deviation. And so you want most of those to be in between plus or minus two. Like if it's over two, it's kind of your posterior is kind of misleading. It's suggesting a proof very it's suggesting a truth very different than what it was. So this isn't too bad, and, and I wouldn't worry about this too much. It's a toy example. It's um, it's binary, and I've actually um, I'm using a, a continuous Z score, right? So, um, but for a toy example, and um, I probably should have left the one in where I had uh, made a mistake with the the, um, the prior parameters because there there were real problems. It was like going from minus four to four. And, There's other kinds of model sensitivity. You can have more focused assessments. And one is from what um, FDA 2010 guidance, which the link is here. The FDA usually recommends you provide simulations of your trial at the planning or IDE stage. This will facilitate the FDA's assessment of operating characteristics of the Bayesian trial, specifically the type 1 and type 2 error rates. Okay. We have this fake universe. We have tons of points where we know what the truth was, and we know what the posterior mean was. Okay, so we're going through that mass of fake universes and evaluating how well the Bayesian analysis that we're using works at each point. And actually, I carried out a feasibility study of calculating the type one and type two error rates with the help of, of a major pharma, pharma consulting firm and. Uh, that's this statistical colleague, Yog Min Yu, at Health Canada back in 2012. And we were worried that it would not be computationally feasible. And we were worried we probably couldn't do it. <laughs> it turns out at that time it was feasible if you were a pharma company and you had a lot of money and you were willing to, <laughs> to hire a, a consulting firm that knew all about all the programming tricks, trips, tricks to make it work. Today it looks pretty straightforward not the same challenge anymore. So pick one universe and repeatedly sample and see what happens. So for my toy example, think of needing to know if fate rates are not greater than 50%. Maybe if they're greater than 50%, they're not allowed. You can't do that to people. Set the probability of fainting to 0.5 and simulate data just for that fake universe. So now we have one fake universe. The faint rate is 50% and we're going to run the Bayesian analyses on that. And then for type 1 error, we're going to see how often the posterior mean was greater than 0.5, which we know is the truth because we said it, over the posterior standard deviation when that's uh, less than minus 1.65 for a one-sided test. Because okay. we're only interested if, we're only worried if it's greater than 50%. Um, and we calculate the 90th percentile of the posterior probability. So each time, each MCMC analysis for each one of these points, you get uh, a percentile, right? And the 90 percentile, we're going to look at that one and see how often it's claimed to be less than 50%. Because if you do a Bayesian analysis and it says 90% likely or 90% probable that it's less than 50%, you stop worrying about it being about 50%. So when I do that, in, all the, in that fake universe of 50% fading, uh, type 1 error rate is about 8.5%, which is not terrible. It's a toy example. I, could, I made that to go up to like 30% by changing the priors and doing other things. 
I think just by changing, by putting in the wrong prior, I've got that. We're putting in a, um, a prior more closely to what's called the default prior, uh, which might be something that people just use. It goes up to about 15%. Like a flat form prior? Well, actually, a default prior uh, for um, proportions tends to be U-shaped. It's a lot of probability on zero and one, and a little in between. Um, and for the 90th percentile, well, this is the histogram of the 90th percentile, um, and this is actually less than 0.5, and it shows that about 30% of the time, in a fake universe where the faint rate actually is 50% of the time, you're going to be led to believe that it's less than. So, you know, this is, you have to be careful when you go from uh, like a frequency statistics, 95% um, confidence interval to like Bayesian posterior probabilities. They don't mean the same thing. Um, and this is one way of checking that out for the data set that you have. And so, I mean, th th this is, again, why you don't have to take anyone's word for it anymore. You create this two-stage sampling, which gives you a set of fake universes where you know the truth, and you see w what the Bayesian analysis would lead you to do over all those um, points. And then you get a sense. Um, now, the last one was uh, model adequacy. Um, and this is checking the posterior itself. And there's not much to see with this toy example, but the example that Michael Betancourt had, um, you would see in the posterior that it didn't generate as many zeros as there were in the actual sample. And so you had to change to something called a zero-inflated Poisson process. Um, yeah, but you were able to see that in the posterior because it would generate you know, future uh, samples which had few zeros, and the current sample had a lot of zeros. And again, this talk was to provide motivation for you to go off and read uh, Michael's material. Uh, there's a lot more detail and, and more interesting examples there. And here's just the posterior plot, because I have such a simple toy example, of course, I know the posterior exactly, and that's in red, and this is the density estimate is in black from the MCMC sampling. It's not bad. Of course, it's a, it's a toy example. It's, it's kind of an easy one to do. But the point was on the next slide here, and it's not that clear, and I probably should have decreased my MCMC sample size to make it clearer. This is really just about the MCMC sample size. And what's recently become a concern is in the middle here, it's usually close, and when you get to the tails, it can be not so good. And that means if you're get, trying to make 90% uh, credible intervals, your endpoints are wrong. And so uh, this is something that has just really been noticed in the last couple of years. There's people who probably knew about it for a long time, but notice there's a problem you have to be concerned about, uh, is checking the accuracy of the posterior quantiles because the, the, the uh, center quantiles will be quite accurate, but the further out you go, the less and less accurate they get. And that's due to the MCMC sample size. So it means you might have to run the MCMC sampler longer. Uh, but this is one of the reasons why you want to sort of, you know, um, connect with uh, a stand group or some other research group where they have a blog where you can just go and, and, and occasionally check or look things up to see where current developments are. So now the summary. Bayes and Ed... Oh, maybe I should have a coffee drink here. <laughs> Bayes enables powerful analyses. With great power comes great responsibility. Safe Bayes requires adequate assessment of the joint model specified. Remember, it's deductive. So the joint model specified is not good, bad results. Posterior sampling carried out, 
usually done by MCMC. There's no guarantees MCMC works. So you always have to be concerned about it. Um, the adequacy of the study design data. Small, noisy data sets or confounded data sets, you're going to be misled most of the time. This is a developing field. One needs to stay current. The joint model defines a set of fake universes and what repeatedly happens in them. That set should, notice I did not say must, should include mostly close enough to our fake universes. Right? They have to be a reasonable guess. Um, if not, the posterior might, again I didn't say will, uh, be misleading for our universe. Two-stage sampling provides a way to assess, assess if fake universes look like us, like ours. Yeah. Okay, you can see it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you want to look at the, the, the prior predictive, which is in the sample space, because you can create sample summaries that are much simpler than a 20-dimensional prior uh, distribution. The posterior needs to be adequately sampled from. Two-stage sampling offers an additional direct assessment tool of whether the sampling from the posterior was adequate. Extraction of information cannot exceed what is actually in the data. If it does, it's error, not signal. Two-stage sampling offers a way to assess the distribution of information in the study design data. So you have all these known parameters and known to be from that parameter sample that you can go through and see how well the Bayesian analysis leads you less astray or more astray. Often Bayesian analysis will be how often the Bayesian analysis will be misleading is important. As uh, Don Rubin, who's uh, he, you know, he's one of the emeritus. Well, he's the chair, was the chair of the Harvard Stats uh, Department, and he was one of the major Bayesian uh, statisticians. In fact, um, many of the people active right now in STAN were his students and, and such. So what he said to me: Smart people don't like being repeatedly wrong. Whatever people say about Bayesian, or, you know, why it's good. And how wonderful it is. Smart people don't like being repeatedly wrong. So if your analysis is going to repeatedly mislead people because of poor data or not good uh, joint models or because you got the MCMC wrong, they're not going to work, not going to want to work with you. Study designs, especially with large sample sizes, can mitigate a poor set of fake universes. It's, it's kind of this trade-off. If you have a real good study design and lots of data, you know, a, a poor uh, joint model can be kind of overcome. But again, um, you need to check. But the other thing is in, inadequate, inadequate posterior sampling and poor data likely fatal. You know, <laughs> if you didn't draw from the posterior correctly, or if your data is you know, biased and you know, there's no way to recover from that. But don't assume or take anyone's word for it. Check. And so that's that's the last slide. <laughs> well, thanks very much. Oh, that's fun. You know, it's, it's, you, you, I, I learned a lot. You know, uh, I mean, I started this two-stage sampling years ago, and I was using it for teaching. And that claim of it being a cheap trick was a little bit true, because there really wasn't anything to do with it, except it may, I thought it made it easier for people to grasp Bayesian analysis. It would, but there's some mental blocks. I think if you catch people after they've done a little bit of NCM, say sampling and programming, then they're much more receptive to it. But what's developed in the last three, three years is this two-stage sampling is sort of integral to this Bayesian workflow. That's what makes it most of it work. So now there's a good reason to spend a lot of time thinking about it and really, really understand it, because it's central to this Bayesian workflow. 
right? You really have to understand why two-stage sampling, you know, is the joint model, and it does give you the posterior distribution when you keep just the ones where the fake data equal the data in your study, right? That's, um, See, this is one of the things that it, it, no one ever gets this first view because there's too much to sink in, right? But here we have the set of fake universes, okay? That, re that's just, that just represents our joint model. Over here in red, that shows where the, con where the posterior probability comes from. It's just identified in this set of fake universes which are most compatible with our universe where three out of nine happen. And that's the Bayesian posterior, exactly. 